Okay, I think we're recording. Uh, it is now seven o'clock, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the winter workshop presentations gone virtual. Uh, for those of you who knew, uh, we had to uh, to cancel the one uh, in December, and uh, so we brought these in as virtual uh, workshop presentations. So we appreciate everybody showing up. Today's program uh, is brought to us with Caitlin Briggs. It's measuring, managing, and modeling for the future, uh, the Farm ES model. Uh, Caitlin Briggs is Director of Environmental Research, Dairy for Dairy Management, Inc. She is an experienced dairy veterinarian with an MBA focused on sustainability. She has a passion for progress towards sustainability in the dairy industry, and especially focuses on animal health as a foundation for sustainable dairy. Uh, after seven years in private dairy practice in Michigan, she joined DMI. As the director of environmental research team, she focuses on farm environmental impact measurement and how herd health is ultimately linked with sustainability. She dairies with her husband in New York, although her practice has taken her today to Idaho. So Dr. Briggs, welcome to the I-29 program. The podium is yours. Thanks so much, Fred, and a pleasure to be here. Though I would have I would have enjoyed, I think, visiting you guys in real life uh, in January, even though I was slightly afraid of the weather, but <laughs> this will, until next time, I suppose. But as Fred said, today I'm going to talk about um, farm environmental stewardship or farm ES. But first, I feel like it's always a little bit helpful, even though Fred did such a wonderful job sharing a little bit about me, I feel like it's always helpful to know who's talking to you. So like Fred said, I'm a veterinarian, um, officially the director of environmental research at DMI or the National Dairy Checkoff. And my husband and I are actually dairy farmers in upstate New York. Uh, we live about 15 miles from the Canadian border on that northern edge of New York and farm 14. We have 1,400 cows and we farm about 4,000 acres. So we, I guess I'd say this this area has become all the more of a passion for me since we took on that endeavor lately too. And as far as things I like to do, I think everything about the outside is something that we enjoy. So hiking, skiing, boating, largely, I think those have changed a little bit since we started farming, but I uh, still enjoy getting out there when we can. So some of you might be wondering, why am I here talking about farm environmental stewardship? Why do we even have it? And I think the answer to that is really a lot of people have questions about the environmental impact of whatever that food is or that product is that they consume. And for us in the dairy industry, that means that companies like the ones that are listed here have made commitments to reduce their environmental impact especially their greenhouse gas emissions. And part of that means that we, as part of their supply chain, are the ones who have to toe the line for that. So most all of these companies actually have created what we call a science-based target. And that means that they have committed publicly to a specific kind of commitment where they have committed to being less than 1.5 degrees Celsius change in their greenhouse gas emissions and the temperature of the earth. So by 2050. So that means basically they want everyone to report on where they are today. And for us, that means we have farm environmental stewardship. So what does it actually do today? It's a model that someone from your processor co-op can come onto the farm and help you to quantify your greenhouse gas emissions and your energy use footprint for a processor co-op, this enables supply chain transparency and what we call scope three reporting. So when we think about greenhouse gas emissions, there are three scopes that we talk about. Scope one and scope two are under the direct control of the processor co-op. So 
Those are the sorts of things like what's actually happening in their processing facility. Scope three is everything that's not under their direct control. So that means those are the farms that they ship that ship milk to them or that are their farmer owners. And then lastly, I think something that we can all get behind as members of the dairy industry is this idea of continuous improvement. We can tell a really incredible story already today with where the dairy industry has um, started and now is today. And farm environmental stewardship really helps us continue to do that going forward. So I think we've all heard this before, but I'll list it just because I think it's a good place to start. And that's that we can't actually manage what we don't measure. And so what Farm ES does is it allows us to measure where we are today with a fairly simple model. So how is it actually implemented for those of you that haven't gone through a Farm ES program? It's implemented the same way that uh, the other farm programs are. Most people are probably familiar with farm animal care in which about 99 or more percent of our milk supply is on. So most people have gone through one of those evaluations. Well, Farm ES happens the same way. It'll be someone from your co-op or processor that'll come out to the farm and ask you some questions. As of today, we have over 3,000 Farm ES assessments completed. This isn't quite 3,000 farms that we've done. It's only about 2,700 farms, different farms, because some have gone through this twice. But still, um, you can see that maybe one of your neighbors has actually completed Farm ES, so you can ask them about it. We have 37 Farm ES participants. So what we consider a participant is that processor co-op who's actually implementing Farm ES. And these 37 participants represent 80% of our milk supply. Like I said before, it's completed by someone who's within your processor co-op. So these are trained, what we call second party evaluators. Um, we think this second party piece is really important because it allows us to have this check on where data comes from, but it isn't too onerous on anyone. And lastly, we do have resources that help assist with implementation and continuous improvement. So you'll see as I go through this that we're updating um, part of this such that it'll be more intuitive as you go through the model. But today, you can certainly log on to the farm website and find a bunch of things to help you prepare for, as well as what to do once you get your answer um, to better know what opportunities might or might not exist on your farm. So how does it actually work? Um, we have broken down a farm footprint into four main areas, feed and feed production, enteric emissions, so those are the emissions that come from the cow and her rumen, manure emissions, which is primarily manure storage and handling, and then lastly, energy. So within each of these, we have anywhere from five to about 15 questions per section, and we, in the end, you'll actually get a footprint for each of these four areas, and then of course your total footprint in the end. So the feed section is based off of 11 different feeds that you can feed and then a large category called other. <laughs> so these are all the things, largely the forages that you might grow on your farm, as well as the key, some of those really key um, concentrate feeds that you might or might not grow as well. Enteric emissions are truly based off of dry matter intake. This is a really great way, a great proxy um, for enteric emissions of dairy cattle. Manure emissions, like I said before, are really largely based off of how you're storing your manure today. So whether or not it's a slurry or an anaerobic lagoon, if you're doing some composting, all of these pieces sort of fit together to help you come up with your manure storage footprint. And then lastly, energy. Um, so this is electricity and any fuel use on your farm. And I will say that through the years of research that we've done on this, manure and enteric are usually the largest portions of your footprint. So when you do get your results, don't be surprised by that. And energy is always the smallest one, um, which might be a little bit counterintuitive because I think we all think about the emissions that might come from tractors um, and tail tailpipes more often than we think about other emissions. But in the grand scheme of the dairy, it's actually a really small portion. So Farm ES is what we call an empirical model because it really just works like a simple mathematical equation. And 
it can accurately account for most farm to farm variability. This is because it's based off of a survey of about 500 dairy farms. And so, as you can imagine, 500 dairy farms are likely doing about 500 different things. And we've been able to create a model that can actually account for most of the differences between these dairy farms. So what does it actually look like or feel like? And that's about 40 questions. And through those 40 questions, it can help you calculate your greenhouse gas and your energy use footprint. Sort of like I alluded to before, the data that we need is actually um, how much milk is produced and the fat and protein content, some herd data, like how many adult animals are in your herd? What percent of the herd is dry? Are you raising any of your own heifers? Those sorts of things. And then, of course, information about those rations, specifically the 11 specific ingredients we ask about, your manure management, and your energy use. And then what do you actually get? You get a breakdown in what we call pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents per pound of fat and protein corrected milk. We break it down by those four categories. And this carbon dioxide equivalent is really how we weight the different gases that are created on a dairy farm. So we have three main gases on a dairy farm, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And they have different weights based off of how warm or their ability to warm um, the atmosphere. And so you're probably wondering, okay, great. Now I know something about what the information is I have to provide, but how is that actually useful today? And so I'd say primarily in two ways. The first is that today, when you get your answer, <clears throat> you'll know where you are both nationally as well as regionally, because you can have that benchmark is an output. It'll also tell you, of course, where you are, but the, it doesn't answer the question of what comes next or, um, help you make any future decisions from there. The other piece that it does is that it allows our processors and co-ops to aggregate in an anonymized way to their customers. So for example, my farm ships to DFA and we sell some of that milk to Kraft Heinz. And so for us, DFA will have our results, but they can't actually show our individual farm information to Kraft Heinz. Instead, they just share that anonymized version of all these farms in the Northeast that might ship to Kraft Heinz. So that's how it works and protects farmer privacy and farmer data in that way. And so all of this being said, um, we're actually really excited about the next version of FarmES and it'll be different in a few key ways. So um, it's based off of a model that's called Rufus, um, which is a process-based model. So if you remember before, I said Farm ES today is an empirical model, meaning it's a pretty simple equation. A process-based model actually accounts for all those cycles that we learned about in high school chemistry and biology. So what that means is that if you think about a corn plant growing in a field, this model will actually take into account the amount of rainfall and the amount of sunshine that that plant is exposed to and the specific soil that it lives in. It'll also take into account how we harvest that plant <clears throat> and any fertilizer that might be applied to it and all of those processes. Then when we store it, it accounts for that part of the cycle. And then of course, the feeding out and the digestion by the cow, her creation of milk, methane, maybe growing a fetus, maybe growing herself and manure. And then the sort of end route of all of those pieces too. So whatever happens to the manure, however it might or might not be processed, stored, and then reapplied to the field. So if you can imagine what this means, it actually provides us the ability <clears throat> to change any given part of that entire cycle and be able to see all the downstream cascading effects. And so what this means is that we can say, how, what happens if we, A, plant something different or put a different amount of fertilizer on this crop? Or B, <clears throat> what happens if all we do is change the manure system? And we can actually compare those in an apples to apples basis because we'll compare the difference in the corn plant all the way through to the specific manure change at the end. 
And what's probably an exciting part of Farm ES version three is that we'll be able to do this from both an environmental and an economic perspective. And so we view this as really a tool that will help producers as well as their advisors help manage these environmental impacts and really have these conversations. We think of it specifically as the producer facing evolution to farm ES. And that's because we have a few different ways that we look at this. One being, <clears throat> if you're a producer who actually doesn't want to put in any more than the 40 needed questions, that's all you have to put in. But if you decided that, let's say, you had another, you were feeding almond hulls and you really wanted to include that, or you're feeding beet pulp and you wanted to know what the footprint was associated with feeding your beet pulp, you could actually toggle on that you're feeding beet pulp or those almond hulls or whatever your favorite byproduct is. And you can use that instead of the default that's sort of been built in there or those with just those 11 previous um pieces of the feed ration the other thing is is that we think about it having three levels one of which is this ability to do pretty basic greenhouse gas accounting just like we do today with farm es the second level is the part that i that i think i presented just a slide ago about it being more advanced and having this scenario planning capability so being able to do those what if analyses we can certainly enter additional data, run scenarios 5, 10, 15 years in the future, and sort of see the impacts. And then the last piece is that piece that people talk about a lot, but maybe we don't have all the keys unlocked to, and that's environmental financing access or carbon markets. And so based off of the type of model that we'll have, and Farm ES is a version 3's ability to model what cover cropping means, what happens if we feed different feed additives, changes to the manure systems, pick anything that you'd like in there. We'll actually be able to prove out and show and have armed producers with the amount of carbon that they're sequestering or mitigating for these conversations with customers or other opportunities as well. And so you might be wondering, okay, great, what sorts of things are we actually gonna be able to model? So this is just a list of uh, some that I think might or might not be top of mind, but are certainly topics of conversation today. So everything from feed additives to conservation tillage uh, to those advanced manure treatment systems. We'll also be able to do probably more interesting things like what actually happens if we have genetic selection decisions that we make or make some changes to the our barn system, for example, and actually reduce lameness on our herd. We'll actually be able to measure that and model that as well. We'll be able to do fairly advanced um, rotations within our cropping fields if we'd like to, including cover cropping, double cropping, triple cropping, and other changes to rations. And then, of course, um, rotations and, of course, wind and solar projects. And so I know I briefly mentioned this before, but Farm ES version three will also have an economic layer to help assess these projects. And that is that within Farm ES, we'll have, and these can also be updated, of course, but there will be default values for feed prices, utility prices, and labor. We, of course, suggest changing these as fit your farm and your situation. But having these baseline changes that are prices built in and then changes built into the model. So say, for example, you decide to change um, your reproductive protocols and you're going to be slightly more aggressive with heat detection, for example. It'll actually be able to model that from an economic perspective using increased labor or technology like, I don't know, SCR collar or other heat detection. And then we'll actually be able to show the environmental impact as well as economic impact of doing a better job with heat detection and getting our cows pregnant faster. Of course, there's a piece in there that's capital expenses, whatever the project is. And these we're sort of leaving open because we know that they're going to vary so much farm to farm. And then what we will do is have the ability to model over a one year, a five to 10 year, and a 20 year horizon to be able to show those economic as well as environmental changes 
knowing that next year probably isn't enough of an answer when we when it comes to an economic or an environmental impact but you do need to know what cash flow is going to look like over the next year so that's why we have these different uh, year ranges that we'll be able to model both of these for to really best understand from an economic and an environmental perspective where we are we think this will help farmers and their co-ops and processors better go to the table to ask partners to assist with some of these or be able to say sorry i can't actually do that because right now those conversations are hard and no one really has the answers to how much a new technology is going to cost or whether or not it's going to cash flow in the future so we hope this will help with that and so lastly just to include the piece about how our processors and co-ops will fare with these updates they're actually being asked as i'm sure producers and processors and co-ops can attest to to do more and more when it comes to meeting customer requests <clears throat> many co-ops and processors are actually being asked to build roadmaps and set goals and right now they don't have great tools for how we can do that but farm es version 3 will help with that because it'll still, of course, aggregate those scope three emissions for our customers. But within our milk shed, it'll actually enable our co-ops and processors to try out different scenarios the same way that it allows farms to, but sort of at a broader level. So these, of course, could be what happens if we put in a community digester, for example, or put in digesters on several farms, or what happens if we cover crop more acres or how do we actually implement a feed additive here and so things like that will actually make it easier for customers and co-ops to better have those conversations instead of making it very one-sided like it is now where customers sort of just ask for requests and processors and co-ops don't aren't armed with the information to go back and have good conversations today so all of this, we think, we actually hope anyway, I guess, that we'll see an increase from that 3,000 farm level that we've got right now in assessments to much more than that, because we hope that producers as well as co-ops and processors will see this as a helpful tool for talking about environmental impacts and really relating it to what's happening on the farm. So we hope this will actually make for an easier transition and the ability to have everyone be on the same page a little bit better about how we can plan for the future. And so all of this being said, um, we make we're on a process of a three year update cycle in farm ES. That's what's happened throughout the entire farm program. And so our next update is due July 2024. And so that's when we'll actually be launching farm ES version three. Where we sit today is, of course, Q1 of 2023, and we're in the process of recruiting farms and doing what we call pilot testing on these farms, where we go out and we say, does this model actually work on dairy farms? To date, we've tested the model on six dairy farms across the US. I will say they are, they have been very patient, and they aren't all that different. They're dairy farms with a lot of data that can answer basically every question within farm es version three but starting in q2 we will actually be going to farms from about 25 cows all the way up to 30,000 cows to make sure it fits and everyone has the ability to utilize this program and represent their dairy we've been working through uh with what we call a working group our scenario analysis development program and that's that Certainly, as I described, you can change any given input within Farm ES version three. But the piece that we're looking to make a little bit easier is a few key toggles that people might be interested in, such that you don't have to go all the way back and change a whole bunch of different inputs, but you could just hit a button and say, I want to do cover cropping and no till, for example, and it'll already have built in the assumed changes that will happen from a um both an equipment need as well as yield changes as well as how we might or might not fertilize differently 
So just as an example there. And then lastly, at the end of this year, we'll actually be working on that user interface and development um, and piloting that out to make sure that it, it does actually feel easy to use uh, for our processors, our co-ops, and our producers. And so I am probably really short on time. And by that, I mean, I didn't talk long enough, <laughs> um, but I'll take any questions and welcome discussion at this point. Fred, shall I We're, stop sharing? We are a fairly small group. If you've got questions, uh, go ahead and just unmute and, and ask the questions. Um, Jim, I see you're unmuted. Uh, what's your first question? Yeah, I've got, I hope I wasn't unmuted the whole while, although I think I was pretty quiet. I've got a, kind of a bunch of questions, but I want to hear what other people have to say. How much is speed? Because we had um, Erin Cordes at the U, had just we were trying to batter around this thing, and she said, you know, raising the feed is a fairly substantial part of the entire carbon footprint and kind of Sort of with that is you're developing these new models. Have you ever tried to run them side by side? How close do they compare with the same inputs? And I know the inputs aren't going to be exactly the same, but will these models go up or down? You know, if you're at a certain carbon footprint right now with the old farm, yes. If you run basically nothing changes on your farm, will your carbon footprint be the same pretty much in the new model? Ah, great questions, Jim. So I'll start with how much is feed? And then I'll try to remember the rest of your questions <laughs> as I go. Um, but I should have said that in the beginning. And that is that um, as far as we know, so the data that we have today says that about a third of the footprint is manure. A third of our footprint is uh, enteric or those em emissions from the rumen when the cow belches. 25 to 30% okay. is feed production. And then the last, you know, about 5% is, um, is that energy piece. I will say that probably as you might expect, the concentrate feed portion of the feed print is where a majority of the feed print comes from, right? So by that, I mean, corn grain, it is more footprint intensive than alfalfa or corn silages, right? And I think that sort of makes sense when we think about maybe not exactly where everyone in the Mu University area lives, but certainly in other areas of the country, that feed needs to be processed and shipped from probably largely the I-29 corridor. <laughs> um, so I think for that reason, we see uh, some higher footprints in that concentrate feed section. Yeah. And then your second question, I think, was where, if I've already done a farm ES evaluation and I'm. How do the two models compare? Yeah. You know, how if do you they have compare? a model. That's a great question. And we, to be totally honest, we don't have an answer for that today because we haven't done that exact comparison between the two models. What we will do, though, is like back run all of the Farm ES version two data through Farm ES version three so that we can actually compare apples to apples where farms have been and where they will be the next time they do Farm ES. So that's probably not the most helpful of answers. The number certainly will be different, but I think maybe for some farms it'll be slightly higher and for other farms it'll be slightly lower. And that's because of how the probably because of how Farm ES version two was created, which I think might get to Heidi's question. So I'm just gonna like roll into that as her question is, can we expand on where the regions for feed averages were established or determined? And so back in the early 2000s, we did a survey of about 500 dairy farms, um, I guess over 500 dairy farms, but in that, we split the U.S. into five regions. Um, the Western region is the largest region because we didn't have quite as many dairy farmers respond there, so we sort of lumped it together. Um, but <clears throat> what we did was we asked about a lot of on-farm practices for those in this survey. And so 
for example, like the entire Northeast is an average of what those dairy farmers from the Northeast said that they did when they grew corn silage, where in Farm ES version three, I'll be able to put in exactly how I grow my corn silage and my neighbors will be able to put in how they grow their corn silage. And so we will actually see differences between that average of the Northeast and what I'm, what I specifically do on my farm. And so I think to your point, as well as Heidi's question, this is why we'll see some of those differences in the, in the number that we get in the end. Does that help? Did I answer both of your questions? Yes, thank you. Hey, Caitlin. Yeah. This is yeah. this is Suzanne. I think one thing to point out to people um, on this is that the regional and farm specific differences are not going to be available to everyone. They're not publicly available. Part of the beauty of Farm ES and the way that we use it through our cooperatives is that it is aggregated and anomalized, just like you said. So because we the last thing we want is for any of this data to to divide farmers against each other, especially with say, uh, Kraft Heinz in, in your uh, situation, if they were to say, oh, well, we only want to find individual farms that have you know, this score or lower. We, we don't want that to happen. We want to look at it by, by groupings, by logical means, but also to make sure that farmers are, individual data is protected and their privacy is protected. Thanks for that, Suzanne. That's a perfect reaffirmation in addition to um, the way I tried to explain the farmer. No, and, and you did an awesome job. It's just one of these things where having sat in on, on a lot of these discussions before, I know that is something at least out in the field here that people say, well, gosh, everyone's going to have access to my farm's data. And no, that's absolutely not the case. And we want to assure farmers of that. Yeah, precisely. So Suzanne or Caitlin, uh, it sounds like Suzanne, not surprisingly, you're up on this. What's stopping me? Say I'm the lowest person that I, I'm the lowest farm in the state of Minnesota. Why wouldn't I want to go shop that to whoever will pay me a premium for that price? What's going to stop a farm from doing that? I get the logic behind what Suzanne had explained. But if I'm low, if I'm high, I want to hide with Suzanne because I know she's low. If, <laughs> if, I, if I'm low, I want to brag about being low and get a higher milk price for being low. Well, first of all, Jim, if you were low and you were able to negotiate with a Walmart or a, a Danone or some other thing like that, that they would listen to you individually, that's great. Most of us don't have that privilege. We have to work through our cooperatives, hence why we are members of cooperatives, so that we have those marketing uh, powers to, to work for us. In that way, if you're a cooperative, you don't want to be in individualizing your farms and saying to Walmart, ah, we're going to get you milk from Jim's farm but not Suzanne's over there because whatever. The cooperatives, it benefits all of us. And, and I think that they would encourage, if I was the high one, they would encourage me to make some changes to my farming practices and maybe even help me to find some funds to cost share those kinds of things. But, but that is the basis of our whole system is that we're all in it together. Oh, you're on mute, Jim, so we can't hear you. So it just makes sense as so kind of kind of, go ahead. This is Dave Thorbon from Select Cyrus Cooperative. Um, how do you uh have you made a determination yet as to how you apply the credits or the the reductions you have to the milk, the meat, and the call cow in this wow. process or are you just strictly weight measuring the farm at this point? No, that's a perfect question. And I should have included that earlier, but we do actually what we it from a greenhouse gas accounting perspective, um, that's called allocation. And so we actually do um, utilize an allocation method that's based off of 
weight, body weight, essentially. But it's sort of the average of Holsteins. So it's about 13%. So for every cow that leaves your farm, like she actually walks onto the truck and leaves your farm, 13% of her whole footprint is actually allocated to our beef supply chain. Um, because that's through lots of mathematics, largely based off of how much it took her to grow versus how much feed she's eaten while she's been lactating. That's the percentage of the, of like the feed and the manure, feed consumed and the manure created and her enteric emissions. That's actually that growing, that growing part. And so that growing part is what's allocated to beef. So that what about sense. what's allocated to the beef calf she produces? The beef calf, so that calf is, if it's sold, then not his or her, I guess it could be either, whole little footprint is allocated to, um, so that gestational additional feed intake that happens, um, those energy requirements are allocated to that calf and that when that calf is sold. So are you saying all of that? Um, cause you know, heifer would be different from a cow that cows lactating in producing a calf. The, if she's a heifer and produces a bull calf, she would have that carbon footprint. And a part of that would go just for developing or for milk production. Uh, and a part of that would go towards that calf versus a guy that has a cow calf operation for a beef on beef. Um, I'm just curious as to how, how that is allocated. Yeah, so in a cow-calf operation, that whole mama cow's um, footprint is allocated toward yes. beef production, right? Yes. And then, yep. but in our dairy cow system, mm -hmm. I, it's probably easiest if we think about it from like a nutrition requirement standpoint. So if you think about, certainly a heifer while she's growing has feed requirements, right? Mm -hmm. And then while in like in her late gestation, she has additional feed requirements to grow that calf. So those additional feed requirements are allocated to that calf. But her like growing feed requirements are allocated toward the beef supply chain. And then like if you picture that first lactation animal who is growing, growing a calf and lactating, that's the perfect way to think about the allocation process in that the feed that's being used to grow allocated toward beef as long as she walks off the farm. Feed being consumed for the calf growing or the fetus growing allocated toward the calf. And that's like, especially if that's a beef calf, right? It'll be go toward that supply chain. If it's a heifer Holstein, it'll stay within our supply chain, right? But say it's a bull calf or a beef cross, it'll go toward the beef supply chain. And then her milk like the nutrition requirements required for milk lactation will go toward dairy. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Before you end on this question, Caitlin, could you go back to the slide where you said the outputs were were described? Because yeah. what you said, maybe that'll help clarify what you just said. Because I'm a little confused yeah. when you were saying, okay, it's allocated to the beef chain. Well, okay, the beef chain has their own measures of sustainability as well. So in how this is broken down, can you kind of explain what you just said a little bit too? Yeah. Um, so the way we, if you think about all of these adding up to 100% enteric energy use, manure, and feed, if a single farm has, you know, 100, or let's just use one, because that's a better example, one pound of CO2E per pound of fat and protein corrected milk, but you're culling 35%, uh, your cull rate is 35%, then you actually, your pounds of CO2E per pound of fat and protein corrected milk is actually only 0.85. So that's, or sorry, I did bad math, 0.65. That's actually you know, minus 35%. Um, so um, yeah, so that's how that works is that we essentially take those cull cows and the percentage of their um, footprint that goes toward the beef supply chain. And it's essentially just subtracted off of the pounds of CO2E per pound of fat and protein corrected milk. Any other questions? 
I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because we are marketing dairy worldwide. Can these benchmarks be compared to dairies elsewhere in the world? I mean, is going to level the playing field for an EU or a New Zealand dairy when the co-op has to compete against them? Ooh, that's such a good question, Fred. And the simple answer is yes. However, <laughs> I will caveat that and say that when we talk about LCAs and greenhouse gas accounting, it's really important that we compare apples to apples. So the long answer is actually no, <laughs> the answer to your question, because unless we do the same mathematics and we draw the same lines around the farm and we include the same, um, and we make the same assumptions, for example, about allocation to the beef supply chain, and we do the same type of analysis to determine feed production footprints, Unless we do all of that the same from the US as well as the EU, as well as New Zealand, for example, you can't truly compare those two numbers or those three numbers. However, that in reality, that's not what people are doing, right? They're saying, based off of LCs that we as a dairy industry have published, they say, wow, the US is doing a really great job. We feel pretty good about buying milk from them. <laughs> and then they say, however it is that they're feeling about New Zealand and or the EU, various countries within the EU. But the, the honest answer is that the methodology used allows us to compare them apples to apples if we do the same math and we include the same variables in the equation, if that makes sense. But if you don't include the same variables in that equation, you can't actually compare them. And that's actually the downfall is that no one has actually compared them the same way. But I will say that from US DEX perspective, our export council within Checkoff, sustainability and being able to talk about the low footprint that US dairy has in comparison to the rest of the world, like on a global level, that is a really important part of the conversation. A follow up. Hey, Go ahead, Jim. I'm just wondering, uh, just a short question. Is this model, is it going to be web based or like spreadsheet based? Mm. Can can Fred go in and do it for a farm that wants some help? Is it just is it proprietary? Can anybody get their fingers on it? Uh, that's a fabulous question, Jim. And the answer is. Because of how Farm ES works, it is through the co-op and the processor. So if Fred worked for Land Lakes, he would be able to have access to it. However, I and Suzanne, as farmers, can have our own login and be able to access it on our own. So if you're a farmer, you can, though to date, we don't have very many farmers that have their own login, I think because they just view it as a headache. I'm not sure. <laughs> but your co-ops and processors are the ones, um, and those representatives there are the ones who could do it. So that being said. Is this a subscription-based or is this just a um, free, uh, free to the farmers? It's paid by checkoff. So it's free to farmers to use. Yeah. Um, and and also uh, through National Milk Producers Federation, our National Trade Association. Um, but I'll just say for farmers, we only get access to our own data, as well as say, like Caitlin said, a regional average or national average. We don't have access to any other individual farms. And from our cooperatives, anyone, I, I shouldn't say anyone, the, the people who are trained to collect the data uh, again, are just that trained. They, they, it isn't just um, Jim waltzing onto our farm and saying, hey, can you give me all these numbers today? Not that he hasn't done that in the past, but <laughs> sorry, Jim. <laughs> um, it is, it is uh, a, a, a process that they, that they get um, trained on because the people that evaluate farm and farm ES, excuse me, evaluate farms on these programs are also trained. 
So it's it's um, it's not it's it's not a free for all um, in, in any way. If that helps. Yeah, I think so, Suzanne. That's a great add. And the the piece that I will add um, is that. So I I said that here. Let me go to the slide. Here, I'll move forward to the slide. Two slides. Here. So Farming S version three will be based off of another model called Rufus. And this model will actually be available for anyone to use and sort of put into their software, right? So if I think his name was Dave, but I'm sorry if it wasn't Dave and I've misremembered, if he wanted to build it into a decision-making tool about what semen farms maybe do or don't want to use on a, like for his technical service providers, he could use the same model or pieces of that same model, right? Like maybe only the animal section of that model to be able to help with some of these conversations from a environmental impact standpoint. So while he won't have access to Farm ES, um, he would have the ability to use sort of like the engine within it um, if he so desired or if his company so desired, because that would take work, right? <laughs> but anyway. I'll just add on to what Caitlin and Suzanne said about um, the evaluators that come on. I'm also an evaluator for the farm animal care program, so it's managed very similarly. You have to meet the same credentials, um, and it's an annual recertification process. So, I mean, you're doing in-person trainings, you're kind of doing uh, virtual retrainings to make sure that everybody is consistently and objectively using the tools across all the dairies that they might be working with. Uh, so, uh, it's it's not something that anybody that's uh, not approved. So if any farms or any um, colleagues might say somebody was randomly asking me about my numbers, but you didn't feel like they maybe were a credentialed person, um, you could be suspicious and that's okay and ask some questions or reach out to the national farm staff to verify um, or reach out to your co-op and processor to verify that they are the specific person assigned to these programs. Thanks, Heidi. That's a great perspective to bring, especially as an evaluator in other parts of the farm program. But yeah, we um, we do view the training aspect of the farm program to be really key. It's how international customers in particular, but also domestic customers, it's where our credibility comes from as a program, is that we have trained evaluators who go out to farms, um, have to keep up their certifications, and um, like essentially the evaluators sort of go through their own audit process in a way because people double check and make sure that they get the same answers, right? Um, and I'm sure Heidi can attest to that from a third party verification standpoint within farm animal care. But we, as an industry, recognize the importance of the role of a trained evaluator in this process. Oh, you're on mute, Fred. While we're waiting for another question, uh, would ask folks to, if they're interested, to uh, go ahead and take a look uh, on the chat box. Uh, we've got uh, a Qualtrics survey to kind of go over and help us evaluate the program we've put on. And then note that uh, this program will be archived they're at the i29muuniversity.com forward slash webinars. So uh, appreciate everybody uh, participating. Great discussion. Uh, Caitlin, fantastic leadership in, in putting the information out. Susan, appreciate your input also. Uh, any other questions? Well, it looks like we've got one uh... sure I'll, I'll read it out loud okay One the there you go. Here says, is there any feel for how co-ops and processors may help all producers have the opportunity to engage in new practices to implement better technologies will there be producer applications or targeted requests to farmers to help them meet their goals or decreases in greenhouse gases 
And I think this question becomes really uh, near and dear as it's being asked all the time, right? Um, we, as Chekhov and as um, NMPF or members of the farm program are asked by a lot of co-ops how to help meet those requests from customers. And so I, one of the, I think one of the important pieces that we're, we as Chekhov and our partners at NMPF are constantly working to provide those resources to help arm producers as well as processors and co-ops with what exactly is an appropriate number to choose, right? If a customer is pressuring you to make some of these changes and meet certain goals. And we think that, or we view Farm ES version three as an opportunity to help be even more specific in how we can answer that question. Because I think both from an economic as well as an environmental standpoint, it's the wild west out there, if we're all honest, when it comes to environmental projects. And right now we have customers going to co-op saying, we have X number of dollars, please enroll 10, 20 farms and do practices. And right now, it's actually hard for us to know whether or not that X amount of dollars is enough to cover some of those practices, right? That they might or might not be asking for on those farms. And we view this version of Farm ES, version three, to really be able to help answer that question because customers have set targets and goals and they need farmers to help them meet those goals. But right now, until Farm ES version three and this new model is out there, we don't have the best available data at our fingertips to be able to say, yes, we can do this and it costs this much, or actually we can't do this until we have X, Y, and Z additional technologies. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I, I think largely those requests come in and we're working really hard to make Farm ES version three and the material that we come up with in the meantime, be able to help answer those requests. Any follow-up questions? I'm not seeing anybody on mute. Kaylin, thank you very much. We appreciate the input. Remind everybody, give us uh, uh, our next program will be on the 16th. And after that program, we will have this on our website uh, there at i29muuniversity.com forward slash webinars. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you.